You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. And welcome back to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. My name is Eric Hardiman. I am the co-host of the show here with my regular co-host, Alyssa Lotmore. Welcome back, Alyssa. Hi, Eric. And I'm excited today to be discussing sepsis. Sepsis, <laughs> absolutely. It's uh, we're, we're excited, actually. We have a, a great interview lined up today. With uh, We have two guests here in the studio with us, Al Cardillo and Lauren Ford. Al is the president of the Home Care Association of New York State. And Lauren... Lauren is Director of Research and Program Development at the Home Care Association. So welcome to the show. They're both alumni of the School of Social Welfare here at the University of Albany. So we're excited always to have alumni on the show, but we're really most interested to find out about the work that you're both doing at the Home Care Association and then particularly about this new project, this new initiative uh, related to education, screening and intervention around sepsis. So we'll get to sepsis, but first we want to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure and a, a privilege, privilege to be here part of the program today. So Al, you have an upcoming workshop, which is why a free workshop, and that's one of the reasons we're having you on right now on April 16th from 1145 to 115 p.m. Uh, in on the downtown campus, 135 Western Avenue. And you're going to be talking about stopping sepsis. And it is a real, you're doing some great work on this topic, but can you start off? It's but sepsis has been in the news recently, but so some people might be more familiar with it. Can you talk a little bit about what it is and just sort of a general overview? Yes, yes, very glad to do that. Um, uh, sepsis, no, and knowing the word sepsis uh, can save your life or the life of someone that you love uh, and uh, are, are very concerned about. Uh, sepsis is the body's uh, overwhelming and life-threatening response to an infection. Hmm. It's it's not the infection itself uh, and commonly thought to be something that occurs in hospitals. Actually, uh, 80 to 90 percent of sepsis cases occur in home and community. Uh, and sepsis is an inflammatory response that it's sort of the body's own um, uh, response that gets dysregulated, gets out of order and actually starts what can actually be a fatal response in the body to an infection. Any kind of infection uh, can result in a sepsis response, something as minor as a, a mosquito bite, a tick bite, a hangnail, um, to something, uh, for example, like strep, or an infection that results from um, from a surgical wound or from a port that an individual might have. Um, sepsis is also uh, uh, not particular to age. So young people, older people, uh, uh, healthy as well as people who are ill uh, can develop sepsis. It is most common uh, in conditions that uh, uh, relate to the elderly, um, where you have a compromised immune system, where you have a source of infection, or where someone has a disability, or, for example, in, uh, 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 in uh, uh, perinatal care, either in the child or in the mom. So it, it, it is, it, there are areas of higher risk which is one of the reasons that the home health care system has become involved and why we've become involved because again because of the prevalence in home and community and the population that home care typically serves it is a population that we believe we can make a contribution to prevent this deadly condition in people and is sepsis particularly found in new york i mean this is the, your organization the home care association is focused on new york state mm -hmm. uh you, you know I'm, I'm not sure if you have the national data but i'm just curious to know sort of where does New York fit in with uh, the rest yes. of the country in terms of this issue? So uh, so over 50,000 people uh, uh, a year um, die from sepsis uh, in New York. Um, uh, uh, nationally, um, 270,000 people uh, a year die from sepsis. One person every two minutes. Every 20 seconds, someone is hospitalized uh, with sepsis. 25% uh, of the dischargees are re-hospitalized with it. There's something like 38 amputations a day associated with it. And on the national scale, sepsis costs $27 billion in our, our hospital system. It's the number one hospital cost and number one uh, death in hospitals. But again, something you don't hear too much about. Yeah, and, and you, you know, if I could ask you to, you know, uh, surmise a little bit, what, what's that about? Why, why is this a hidden emergency, a hidden medical emergency that folks don't really talk about as enough? 
And thank you. That that's really a, that, that question is so on point. Um, we know that in circumstances like stroke, for example, there's been a lot of education about recognizing signs and symptoms. The same thing with a cardiac event. In the case of sepsis, it's most treatable when identified early on, but early on are when symptoms are diffuse or they're not easy to recognize. And so what happens is, is that it's not until the person starts to feel uh, so ill, so incredibly ill, uh, or, are, or in fact are taken to the emergency room where it is often diagnosed. But because with, with each hour of delay, there's an 8% increase in mortality uh, in the patients, many times by the time the person hits the emergency room or critical care, they're already crashing. Mm. Some, some, from the time they go from the emergency room into critical care, they go from being uh, upright to being on a ventilator. That's how quickly the condition can wow. move. So it's something that even in the medical professional industry, very often, I think CDC found that seven out of 10 patients with sepsis had interacted with a provider that had not recognized the signs and symptoms even on their own. So this is really part of a major education effort as much as it is a clinical screening. So we're talking about signs and symptoms. Is there anything else you'd want to add for somebody who's listening who might not know really what they should be looking for? I don't know, Lauren, if you want to answer that one. Yeah, definitely. So <laughs> there is um, there's a handy acronym that it, it goes uh, by sepsis. And uh, if you notice um, symptoms such as if you start with S, shivering and a fever, or if you feel very cold, and you move to E, you feel extreme pain or general discomfort, you know, the worst ever pain you may experience. Or P, uh, pale or discolored skin. S, you're feeling sleepy, you're, you're difficult to rouse, um, you feel confused. I, you, you feel like you might die, you're having that, that really, really bad feeling. And then the last is S, and you're feeling very short of breath. Those symptoms are very similar to hypothermia, hmm. um, and so that's why... Um, a lot of times it's not detected in its early stages because it's confused with many other conditions. One of the things that occurred, you know, particularly this spring, you heard about the number of cases where individuals died from the flu. Right? Right, but but right. a lot of times those cases are really cases that have evolved into sepsis. Uh, you know, very recently, the very high profile case of Whoopi Goldberg, mm -hmm. you know. So very often it's something that's not detected uh, early on, um, again, because of the nature of those symptoms. But that's when it's most treatable. And that's really why we took this initiative at the community level to try to make a, uh, uh, an intervention in this. And it sounds like, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but some of the education that needs to happen is not just with the general public public, but it's also with the healthcare system and with medical providers that so sometimes this um, illness or, the, or this situation, this condition is, uh, is misdiagnosed or missed in the medical system. Yes, absolutely. And so one of the things that New York did a few years ago, which really uh, uh, was a leadership step in the country, is to require all hospitals to have protocols for sepsis assessment in the emergency room and then really throughout. Uh, working sort of on a parallel track, we, uh, we look to create uh, a set of protocols for the community that would be used by practitioners in community health to, uh, to assess for signs and symptoms or risks for sepsis at every clinical visit to an individual. And so we've actually made that a standard of care within the home health system in New York, creating a unique uh, instrument uh, for doing that. And Eric, you mentioned about the breadth of the project. So while we're focused in New York, other states are replicating our model as we speak, uh, entire states uh, or systems in other states. It's yeah. a growing opportunity. So let's, we'll come back to sepsis in a minute, but I, I want to talk a little bit about your organization, the Home Care Association of New York State. How did, uh, how did you come to be involved with the Home Care Association and wh what's the scope of work that your organization provides? Well, um, my story actually goes back quite a ways, but uh, so I'm an alum of the School of Social Work here at the university. And actually, um, uh, I got my start in this whole field of, of home care and public health <clears throat> back at a time when the when this was a very formative level of uh, system development in the state, I happened to be in the office of my advisor, uh, Professor Cohen, who received a call saying, we're looking for someone from the university that would be interested in being part of this new project uh, to develop alternatives to institutionalization and in-home care and support. And he said, he's right here with me. I'll send him in. And so my career really started way back uh, in that way. And then 
about 12 years ago, I circled back to actually become part of the Home Care Association and, and last fall was appointed as the president. And, and tell us just, you know, for those listening, and if you just tuned in, we're listening to an interview with Al Cardillo, president of the Home Care Association of New York State. What, what is the, the breadth of what the Home Care Association does? So, so as, as an association, we, we represent and work with uh, uh, providers of in-home care. So, uh, for example, a visiting nurse association, hospice providers, uh, uh, hospitals like St. Peter's that have a, a very substantial home health program. Program. So these are organizations that deliver professional and supportive services in the home. Mm-hmm. Pretty much the way the system is evolving, it really is sort of you know from birth to end of life care. So home care agencies are involved in supporting women that have that have given birth and come home a day early, uh, to uh, support for medically fragile children to doing in-home assessments for asthma uh, risks, uh, as well as, you know, day-to-day support for individuals who have diabetes, uh, 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 congestive heart failure, and it's a mix of professional, technological, and supportive services that are provided. It's important work. Um, So, uh, as I said, we've been talking with Al Cardillo, the president of the Home Care Association, and tell us a little bit about how sepsis came onto the radar of the Home Care Association. So, uh, about, uh, I would say, 10 years ago, uh, the Sepsis Alliance, which had been formed following the the death of a a young woman, Erin Flatley, who who just had a simple surgical procedure, developed sepsis from it, and, and, and passed within several days. Sepsis Alliance was formed to try to pr- increase awareness and education. We were contacted by Sepsis Alliance to say, have you ever heard the word sepsis before? Would you know about it in your system? And they were calling every state. So uh, I did some outreach. Um, and what I found was most of the time I talked to practitioners, they associated it with something very serious, but in the hospital. Um, a, a few years later, and this was after the passage of Rory Stoughton that led to the hospital protocols, we visited the issue again, and and again, the focus seemed to be, well, this is a hospital problem. But when I looked at the data, I looked at the overwhelming uh, percentages of readmissions to hospitals, uh, and also we came across the statistic which showed 80 to 90 percent was prevalent in the community. So we said, well, there must be something that home health can do to intervene in what is a catastrophic life altering life-threatening problem. So I called across the country. No one was doing anything on the community side. The focus was critical care and maybe getting it to the emergency room. But when we inquired, they said, if you do something, we'll support you. So in that effort, we uh, we uh, engaged the support of the chief medical officer of National Sepsis Alliance, uh, a the, the chief of medicine at Northwell University Hospital in uh, in uh, uh, Long Island, who had implemented a hospital sepsis program, and they worked with us with a group of home care clinicians uh, led by Amy Bowerman uh, in our membership. And we put together the uh, sepsis assessment tool and intervention tool in the community. So that's how it came to be. And and again, we continue to be the first and only uh, state uh, and system doing this. We've been very strongly supported by the CDC, uh, who also has our materials uh, linked to their sepsis clinical resource site. No, I've learned a lot already just from what you've been talking about, about sepsis. And I want to focus a little bit on this training that's happening on April 16th. It's a free training. It's a, it's a workshop for faculty here at the university, for students, and also community practitioners. Yes. It's a free continuing education credit for licensed social workers. And I just want to read from the little bio or overview, I guess, from the flyer. It says, a must attend for clinicians and health and human service organizational leaders. What you need to know about sepsis and saving lives. Tell me a little bit about how, what this workshop is, why you're having it, and how it's going to impact the community. So um, uh, we received a major grant uh, uh, about a year and a half ago from the New York State Health Foundation to conduct training of this type around the state. And that training encompassed home care practitioners, uh, hospital uh, 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 sepsis coordinators, physicians, EMS, and others. And so um, so we, we had this program that, that was established and, and Sepsis Alliance, uh, which has a national, uh, national audience, actually a global audience, uh, thought that this kind of training should be brought 
to the entire country. So they contacted us and said, we would, we would like to uh, do a video of a workshop that you can hold to, uh, 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 on this model that you have and, and on your training in sepsis. And we will, we will provide that as an educational tool around the country to every home health agency and every uh, every applicable setting. So that's how the workshop came to be. So what will happen in this particular workshop is it will be a, a bona fide workshop that we'll be giving, but at the same time, there will be a production crew that will be filming this workshop uh, and it will be used again as the basis for national education. Sepsis Alliance has done this for, with the, with the uh, emergency uh, medical technicians, with nurses and other areas. And so uh, this is something that will now add the home health dimension to the training program. And you're really positioning your organization and New York State as a whole as being a leader nationally to, to use, to have a project like this where a film is being made and training materials will be provided around the country to really address this issue on a larger scale is, is tremendously exciting. Thank you. And, and, and certainly as, a, as an adjunct member of the School of Social Welfare, um, it's, it's with great pride to uh, also have this hosted at the university and specifically at the School of Social Welfare. Yeah. And I wanted to talk about that. So Al Cardillo, who's here as the president of the Home Care Association of New York State, is also um, one of our faculty members, an adjunct faculty role, and teaching courses in our master's degree in social welfare program. Can you tell us a little bit about the course you're teaching now and sort of the work that you do as an instructor? Of course. I, and and, uh, and it's, 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 again, it's a great privilege for me to be able to do that uh, with the university. So I teach the course in legislative advocacy. And in that, what we do is we explore um, the, the, the legislative and policymaking process of, uh, throughout all of the various venues, through the legislature, the governor's office, the state budget, state agencies and implementation, and really show how it's all interconnected. <clears throat> now, in most cases, people would say in those environments, what does that have to do with social work? But the bottom line is, it's all about social work. And in particular... The social work training, uh, the education of social workers is the, is the ideal training for that environment. And, and the way I like to teach the course is really from the micro clinical perspective. Here's how you look at an individual if you were going to engage them in identifying problems, needs, and solutions. Here's how you would assess. Here's how you would implement. It's the same principles in the policy environment. So to have social workers sort of embrace this not as something over there where social work is over here it's yes this is part of your social work environment yeah and i um i was actually a student in al's class and that is how we met and sort of how i came to uh, work at the Home Care Association. So my experience in uh, entering this field, it kind of mimics what Al's was, uh, however, however long ago that was. Um, it was, uh, um, it, his class was uh, an amazing oppor opportunity to learn more about the macro practice and how um, policy and legislation impacts um, individuals, communities, and organizations. So um, in my experience working for the Home Care Association, it's it's not the individual client who you're working for, but it's it's the community. It's the mm -hmm. it's the people who need uh, home care services. It's it's helping improve access to those services and make sure um, everybody is able to um, get the services that they need. It's exciting to hear about this work that you're doing as alumni of the school. Uh, as Alyssa and I have talked about already this morning, April is is Public Engagement Month here at the University of Albany, and that that concept of public engagement, community engagement is tremendously important for the university, uh, also for the School of Social Welfare, that, that we do projects like we're doing, you know, uh, like we're doing here at the radio show, but also um, connecting with organizations like the Home Care Association, teaching students how to connect in the community, how to engage in advocacy, and uh, to connect with policymakers, to connect with the legislative process, to connect with populations that maybe need services but aren't getting them, or to, to educate the public about an issue like sepsis that is not always out there in, in the common discourse. And so, uh, so that idea of community engagement, I think, is, is really, really 
really powerful right now, particularly in April. So, Al, I wonder if you had any thoughts about that and sort of how community engagement plays a role for you. Uh, I, I do very much. Uh, I, 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 in, in that regard, one of the one of the points I would like to make is Lauren, in her time with us, is, is already making a tremendous mark, not only in the association but in the policy environment and in, engaging the community both both in terms of areas of needed service as well as in working with us uh, on on initiatives. So one thing, for example, that uh, so April is also Minority Health Month, for example. Lauren, one of her first projects that she did with us was to put together a um, a, a brief on health disparities and on the uh, on the capability, some of the unique capabilities of the home health system working with physicians and hospitals to address disparities. It's certainly, uh, you know, Martin Luther King said that uh, the greatest uh, among the greatest injustices is is inequity and injustice in health care. And we very much believe that. And so this piece that we've developed is really an anchor to try to increase attention and bring all parties together working toward disparities. And of course, Eric, we're working together right now on a project that would bring the university system and students together with home health and uh, hospice providers in areas of new research. Right. Yeah, and right now a lot of the work that we're doing um, as far as the uh, the health disparities piece and we have, you know, we're highlighting asthma management programs, the sepsis program is really to educate legislators and policymakers and help widen the lens through which home care is viewed. Um, and that is how you make change in policy. And all of this seems to be related to community change and social change and sort of looking at ways that the university, that our students, that our alumni can participate in that type of change and really working toward improvement of the social good through the important work that you're doing. Uh, you mentioned, Al, that it was an honor for you to teach. It's really an honor uh, for us to have you on our faculty and, and have you working with our students. I, it strikes me, you know, listening to Lauren as a former student of yours, that, that it really is a special privilege for students to be able to learn from you and to see this, to see community engagement in action, to see what social work can be, what it can do in the community. Um, and, and so this important work is, is, is really critical. So thank you for the work that you're thank both you. doing. Alyssa? No, and as we wrap up here, is there anything that you'd like to leave our listeners with? I mean, I've learned a lot uh, already about from this, and I want to promote one more time your upcoming free workshop on April 16th from 11.45 a.m. to 1.15 p.m. at the UAlbany Downtown Campus, 135 Western Avenue, held in the Houston Amphitheater. That's uh, Houston Hall, room 106A. So it's, again, it's a free workshop open to community practitioners. Aside from them getting information there, is there anything else that you'd like to leave with them about sepsis? and maybe we've talked about the risk factors and we've talked about the symptoms. Is there anything else that you want somebody to know? Sure. I, I think the main thing I would like to emphasize is, is how important it is to, to, to have basic uh, uh, understanding of what this condition is. Because as I said, you may save your life or the life of someone that you know and love. I recently, we, we have a, a steering committee that guides our project. And the, uh, the, the commissioner of the state office for aging, uh, Greg Olson, who's also an alum of the school, um, is on our steering committee. He recently received some feedback from members of his own team there about, because Greg talks about this now all the time, uh, about the extent to which just from hearing from him, they have actually identified individuals as lay people who are showing signs and symptoms, who have been told by their doctors that their knowledge that they might have had sepsis has saved their life. Hmm. So I think the main th really thing that we want to really uh, um, get across is, is, is that please come to this workshop to support that area of knowledge in yourself and in everyone else that you might know. Uh, uh, the, the father of Rory Staunton, uh, we've had him, uh, Kieran Staunton, we've had him in, in, in our programming. And one of the things that he has said is, if you care about your family, if you care about this issue, tell, some, tell uh, someone uh, that you know, in fact, many people that you know every day, just tell them this word and tell them to keep their eye out for what these signs and symptoms might be. No, since our show is available on podcast, some individuals may listen to this after the workshop has already happened. So if they want to find out more or be connected with your agency, what is the best way for them to do that? 
So they can they can contact us uh, at the at the Home Care Association. We actually have a, uh, an email address specifically on sepsis. It's www. tool at hca. dot org. Actually, I think the www doesn't belong. That's the website. We have a we have a stop sepsis at home website. Okay, so it's www. stop sepsis at home ny. dot org. And the email address is a, a sepsis tool at hcanys.org. And then there's the Sepsis Alliance. That's www.sepsis.org. And there is the Rory Staunton Foundation for Sepsis Prevention. And if you just put that in, it'll bring up the website. And we will include all of these links on the podcast page, on the Facebook page, uh, maybe Twitter as well. We, we will we'll make sure to cover the social media links, which <laughs> Alyssa is particularly good at. And uh, um, so we, we will make sure that listeners to the podcast also get this important information because I think that's a, that's a great point. Been Thanks listening so to an interview here with Al Cardillo and Lauren Ford. Al is president of the Home Care Association of New York State and Lauren Ford is the director of research and program development. Thank you both Thank so you. much for being on our show and uh, stick around for more information here on The Social Workers and we'll be back live in the studio again in the near future. Thanks for listening to The Social Workers, WCDB Albany. You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany.